He's what we call an OG. I watched all 11 episodes of his podcast and he changed my life forever. Please welcome to the stage, Andre Norman. I just want to see you because you need to be seen. I want you to hear this. This is your life in this room. Your future's here right now. Today I got a message for you. Possibility. I stand here because possibility is real. I'm gonna spare you my lifetime trauma of growing up in the hood with bad parents and bad neighbors. I'm gonna spare you the time that I quit band because my friends thought it was stupid and black kids don't play music. I'm gonna spare you all the times that my father never showed up to take me any place on a Saturday. I'm gonna take you to the day I stood in front of a judge and he just started reading off sentences that added up to 95 years. Then they put me in a van as an 8 year old and took me to state penitentiary and they dropped me off. My first day I was terrified. What's gonna happen to me? How's this gonna work? I've heard all the bad stories. When I walked into the unit, I made up my mind. I'm fighting the first dude that comes up on me. He's getting the business. They gonna know I'm a fighter. And I got my hands ready, got my bedroll, and the dude said, yo Dre, I dropped my bedroll, put my hands up. Dude said, yo Dre, it's me Melvin from the dummy class. I, he said, where you been? We knew you was coming. What took you so long? My friends were at the penitentiary waiting for me. It wasn't a mystery that I was coming to prison. They were like, yo, Johnny here, Stevie here, we all, it's all good. You monks family. Next day I go to the program building and a caseworker sat me down and said, I can get a forklift degree, this degree, that degree, this degree, and I can go home a better man. I went back and I called my mother. I said, mom, prison's not as bad as we thought it was. I can get all this stuff done and I can go home and be great. She said, good, Dre, go get it done. Then one o'clock, I'm at the gate. I'm ready to go to school, get my GED, forklift. I got the whole lineup. I got a whole bunch of years. I'm gonna get a whole bunch of stuff done. Then the homies pulled up on me. Where you going, Dre? So I'm going to school. He said, oh, he got that caseworker talk. I said, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, they told you forklift, GED, college. You can be wonderful and you can be great. But you see them kids over there, them white dudes, as soon as they find out you're by yourself, they're going to run up in the room, they're going to beat you, and they're going to take all your stuff. And that caseworker's not coming to help you. See them boys over there? That's the Latinos. They're going to run in your room when, when the white boys leave, and they're going to beat you down and take what's left. See them brothers? They're going to run in after the Spanish boys. When you ain't got nothing, they're going to beat you twice for not having nothing. And that caseworker's not coming to help you. But if you roll with us, ain't nobody going to do nothing to you. They gave me a knife. I threw a little pamphlet in the trash. I went to the yard. I started working out. I started getting down with the program of staying alive. And I spent the next six years staying alive. It wasn't about no school. It wasn't about no program. Staying alive. And six years in, I'm sitting in max security segregation for two more attempted murder convictions I picked up in the jail, and I think I'm winning. I'm winning. I'm the third ranking gang member in the state. I'm winning. And I realized something. I was a king of nowhere. At the end of the day, in the beginning of the day, I was a king of nowhere. I controlled really nothing. It was all a mental thing. So I came up with a concept of being in jail doesn't make sense. So I had to do something else. I said, I want to be free. That's what we all say, we want to be free. You know what free is? Free is the parking lot. I can get you free in about 30 seconds, walk you through three doors, you free. We hit the parking lot, like, what do I do now? I have no plan. My plan was to get free. Well, free, as soon as you step outside the door, hit the parking lot, you free. See all the staff that leave here, they get in their cars and they go somewhere. They got a plan what happens when they walk out the gate. We had no plan. We get outside the gate, we sit in the parking lot, we lost. So we go back to what we did before. I said, I got to do better than free, because free don't work. 70% of people come back. That's facts. They call them recidivism. We call them dudes coming back from the pen. What's up, man? How was it out there? Man, you know what I'm saying? It's popping out there, man. It got a new club. Oh, all right, cool. So I don't want to be free, because free don't work. Remember that. Gentlemen, free don't work. I said, I want to be successful, because successful people don't come here. So I said, where do successful people come from? They said, college. I said, I'll go home and go to college. Now I'll be successful and I'll never come back again. 
So I picked a school called Harvard University. I came out my cell the next day. I told my homies, I figured it out. I'm going home. I'm going to Harvard. I'm going to be successful. They're like, what? I said, you lost your Dre snapped. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I figured it out. They said, you can't do that, Dre. You're black. You're in the hole with trying to kill eight people. You're a gang leader. You're good at it. You're one of us. We rock with you. I said, nah, we can all go. They're like, Dre, you bugging. This is our life. Accept your lot. Now, the truth is, what I was really hearing was my friend saying, because generational curses, what we don't understand is, we can go to the creek, boy, but Mr. Massey ain't going to let us go past the creek. We had to come back here. We can go to the creek and come back here, but you talking about going to freedom? Nah, nah, I can go up the hill a little bit, but you talking about never coming back here? Boy, you crazy. You better get us all in trouble. You talking about never coming back? You better get us all. Boy, you can't talk like that. I called my father and said, Dad, I'm going to Harvard. He said, boy, you're talking crazy. <laughs> See, my father grew up in a town called Petersburg, Virginia in the 40s where it wasn't cool being black. And he went through a lot of turmoil. And they said, well, Dre, that's, why are you bringing that up? That was before. Let me tell you, I am the first in my family's history. I am the first generation to be born at, in a hospital. My father, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents were all born at home because it was against the law to be born in a hospital. I am the first in my generation to be born in a hospital. And had I lived in Virginia in 67, I'd have been born at home. My father has real trauma that is unresolved and unhealed. And he gave it to me, or he was trying to at least. He said, Dre, don't talk like that. That's crazy talk. Come home, work in the factory. I said, I don't want to work in the factory, Dad. He says, boy, you don't listen to me. That's why you're there. I said, no, you weren't there for me. That's why I'm here. I went back to my son. I realized something. I'm on my own right now. My homies ain't going for it. My mom and dad ain't going for it. So I looked in the mirror. I said, what's inside of me that's stopping this dream from happening? I'm black. I can't read. I'm a gang member. I got 105 years. I got anger issues. I wrote all my stuff down. And I started working on one thing at a time. What can I do first? GED, I went back to school. And my GED teacher told me, Andre, that's a great idea. You should go to Harvard. She supported it. I got out of segregation. I went to an anger management program because I had a slight anger management problem. Anger management teacher said, great, that's great. You should go to Harvard. And I just kept going to programs. I kept going to stuff. I walked away from the gang life, but you can't never walk away from the homies. And I'm going to programs every day. And I get to one program. I taught myself the law, reversed one of my cases, but I couldn't go home because I picked up two cases in prison. So I get to the anger management, the, the six-month program, the best program you have to do before you see the pro board. I got in first. Day, the homie said, listen, this is how this works, Trey. First part of the class, you answer one question. Second part of the class, you answer one question. Your program compliant, they can't kick you out. I said, that's dumb. They said, no, that's how you get your certificate. You go home. I said, I'm not doing this program to get out. I'm doing this program to stay out. And I spent the next 18 months learning what I needed to do to stay out. And November 15th, 1999, I came home. And it's been 23 years I've been home because I did the programs to stay out. I didn't fake them. I didn't front them. I wasn't faking a certificate. You're talking about, look at this. I said, no, look at what I learned. Watch me apply it. There's three types of people who come to prison. There's the leaders, there's the followers, and then there's the victims. I don't know who's who, y'all can front and cuff and go lift all the weights you want, but I'll look at you and tell you who you are if you talk to me long enough. And since I've been home, I started speaking. I started training. And I started speaking. First with little black kids in the hood, because that's why I felt comfortable. Then little, little girls, right? Started talking to them because they had problems too. I started talking to white kids because unbeknownst to me, they had problems too. I watched Live the Beaver my whole life. They never had a problem with my partridge family. These are the white kids that's drinking, smoking, and cutting up. I'm like, what is this about? They said, man, we got problems too. So I turned my concept from helping little black kids. I just help people. If you call my phone, I answer it. And with that mindset, I've been over 23 countries around the world. I just went to Curacao two weeks ago, and I'm on stage. I gave a speech to 250 people from Holland. Then they, somebody in the audience got up and they called the prime minister of the country and said he can't leave. And they asked me to stay an extra week and took me to prisons and schools around their nation to help heal their land. You are sitting here 
with so much opportunity. You are sitting here with the opportunity to be great. But are you really willing to put in the work to be great? Yeah, you see me on a podcast, but you don't see me working. Oh, man, Dre cool. Dre ain't cool. You don't want to work for me because I'm about this life. I no longer make excuses. I make stuff happen. I've had the president of the United States call my phone and hire me. I had the United Nations call my phone and hire me. I work at Harvard Law School. I'm a Harvard Law Fellow. This ain't make-believe. When they called me and said, Dre, you want to come to prison in Kansaki? I said, sign me up. If I had came in September, I was going to bring my son here to say, son, look at these men. Look at these men. My son would have walked up to you and said, you going to be like my dad? You going to be great too? You going to make the president call your phone and you going back to the block to make an excuse? You're going to blame it on somebody. I say this to you, even though some of you are older than me. I have a 17-year-old who's on his way to Stanford. My wife has a PhD from MIT and a master's from Harvard. It was my choice who I married. I was taught by my rabbi, who you marry is everything. Pick the right wife, because it will dictate where your life goes. So when I went out looking for a wife, I found someone with credentials, Competence and faith and stability. My son is on track to Harvard and to Stanford. He can pick any school he wants. And I say this to you, gentlemen, with all the respect in the world. If I was your father, you would not be here. Because I'd have had a plan for you before you was born. I had a plan for you the day you showed up. And I'd have executed that plan the whole way through. My father didn't have a plan for me, so the streets did. My mother didn't have a plan for me, so the streets did. What can you do? What can you be? I've been all over this planet changing lives. They said, Dre, come to Kansaki. I said, in a minute. I just spent two weeks on the road. I got home Wednesday night, got up the next morning, flew up and drove two hours to make sure I was here. And there's three people who were supposed to be with me. They didn't make it. They had excuses and stories. I don't make excuses. I show up. Because I know it's like for people not to show up. Of all my accomplishments since I've been home, Harvard fellow, White House employee, United Nations contractor, teaching and preaching all over the world, I helped create the Office of Faith Base. I can give you a list of stuff, which is phenomenal. What I did for my parents, what I've done for my siblings, what I've done for communities around the planet, around substance abuse, addiction, depression, prison reform. I was at the first table when they started talking about reentry. I was at the table when they created the term. My biggest accomplishment, I would say, standing in this room, it was like a year ago, the commissioner of the state that used to hold me, I used to sit in these chairs, called me up and gave me a contract to come back to the prison that I lived in and run the unit that I used to run as an inmate. <laughs> Is your journey so compelling that you're gonna get this man and say, we need that man back inside Kentucky? Because that's what my commissioner said. We need that man back inside this building. Is your life that far along? Are you that committed? Are you that serious? See, I live my life in a way every day I can stand and advocate for people, regardless if they look like me or not. So if one of you ever went to the parole board and you say, your dad needs your help, I would say, your honor, this man standing before you, I know he's here and he has a serious charge. I'm not negating that. 25 years ago, I had a serious charge. And I went before a parole board, and I promised them that I would do good for the rest of my days if you give me a chance. And for the last 23 years of my life, I've traveled the world doing good. Fighting terrorism, fighting drug addiction, fighting depression, fighting suicide, fighting racism, training companies. And I've been doing this based on a promise. And I know what talent looks like. This man has the talent that I need. If you be so kind to let this man come work alongside me, I will mentor him to where he needs to be because I need help in this fight. And he has a voice that you can't create someplace else. It's called experience. I live my life in a way I can stand in front of anybody, anytime on your behalf. Are you living your life in a way where you can be accountable? That your, your voice can free somebody else? Or is it all about you? I came here today to say, yo, this is possible. They got these things now. This is a game changer. 
This is a game changer. This is a game changer. Every last person can be educated. Every last person can be touched with one of these. This man allowed this to come in. He could have said, no to this, no to that, nah, nah, nah. This is a game changer. But are we still holding to the old games? Are we looking at what's wrong and what we don't got? Are you ready or are you ready now? Yo, Dre, I want to come work with you when I get out. No, you don't. Can't work for me. I'll show you how to, have, how, how to have your own. I don't need a bunch of dudes hanging around my house. I don't get down like that. <laughs> my wife be like, what are they doing here? Why are you bringing your work home? <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, honey. No, nah, I ain't know you know, honeys. I will teach you to have your own. But my question to you is this. Are you content? Are you happy? Are you complaining? How many hours a day are you spending studying? I spent eight years, 20 hours a day studying. And that eight years I spent studying prepared me for today. And when they called me, I said, where are my people? They said, your people are up here, Dre. I said, I'll be there. Nobody paid me to be here. Nobody bribed me to be here. When they canceled the last one, I didn't care. I'm back. And if you allow me, I'll come back as many times as you have me. I'll go to many facilities as you want. We do staff. Listen, you want to make this better? I stand up. These people standing around us with the blue on, if you ask me, if we don't make them better, you never get better. This ain't us against them. It's over. Man, they didn't do this for me. They didn't do it for that for me. Well, they, they didn't make you do what you did to get here. And in case you're clueless, you're in Kansaki, New York. There's not a lot of black people live in Kansaki, New York, so you're not going to get a diverse staff. It's just not possible. So you have to teach the people who are here how to communicate with you better. Instead of saying, man, why don't you go get 50 black people? Because you wouldn't move up here to come work here. So don't expect somebody else to. You have to make do with what you got. You have to make do with what you got, and this is what you got. So make it work, or just complain and have less. I ask you, are you ready? Are you serious? Because there's a world of people out there who need your voice. Who need your voice. And if you don't bring your voice to the people, you're doing yourself and this world a disservice. This world is way bigger than New York. We're global with this. I appreciate you all. I appreciate you having me. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the day excuses are over. The next time I see you, I'm going to ask you, how much work did you put in? Uh, I can't say it. Man, man, kick rocks, man. I ain't got time. If you ain't trying to be the best, I can't talk to you. If you ain't trying to be the best, I do leadership development. I don't do follower training. I appreciate you. God bless you. And I'll see you.